to another video. Today we're going to be uh, talking about George Soros here. There is um, four articles here by the Niagara Independent, uh, which is in uh, Ontario, of course, in Canada. And there's a very great reporter here that I, I really like his articles, Chris George. Um, these articles are from July, and he did a, a little mini-series on George Soros. So he's got four articles. I don't know if we're going to have time to cover them all in one video or if maybe we'll have to tackle two and do two in another. We'll see how much time we have here. But uh, yeah, George Soros has got his hands in, in a lot of places, um, controls a lot of things because he has a ton of money and uh, he uses it in not so productive uh, means to manipulate and, and um, be a puppeteer uh, to control people and move them into whatever positions he wants, um, including Justin Trudeau, who uh, we'll cover in here, has also met with George Soros on, on several occasions, it's the same with Freeland, his second in command. So uh, we'll may as well get right started in here. So the first article that uh, jo Chris George wrote on George Soros is uh, just introducing George Soros. So that's the picture of him. He doesn't look healthy, but he is he, he's fairly old, so... Um, that would be wise. So billionaire George Soros. Um, who exactly is George Soros? Is he a billionaire investor and philanthropist or a Machiavellian globalist bent on creating discord? Soros multi-million dollar donations to political causes has had different influence on the outcomes of political battles and on elections around the world, including in Canada. So what are the beliefs, aspirations, and goals of this man? According to Forbes magazine in 2018, George Soros was the 29th richest person in the world with the, and the richest hedge fund manager with a net worth of over 25 billion US dollars. That same year, the British news organization Financial Times named Soros Person of the Year, describing him as a standard bearer for the liberal democracy, an idea under siege from populists. Next month, when Soros will turn 90 years young, it is expected he will be adorned and feted for his leadership in advancing global causes. Bottom line, George, George Soros has a lot of money and is an influential force on the world stage. Soros injecting himself into current affairs as a mega donor for progressive movements around the globe has expectedly created his detractors, many fueling conspiracy theories about the man and his intentions. Veronica Bondarenko, I probably slaughtered that name, reported in Business Insider that for two decades, some have seen Soros as a kind of puppet master secretly controlling the global economy and politics, dubbed in the media as the connoisseur of chaos. He has been accused of being the Sultan of Antifa, hiring protesters, renting buses, and even stashing piles of bricks to be hurled at police through glass storefronts. Currently, there is a campaign urging international authorities to investigate George Soros for funding domestic terrorism and his decades-long corruption. Most recently, Soros made headlines with his private dinner speech to elite business leaders at the annual 2020 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. He unloaded on US President Donald Trump, forecasting in the upcoming elections he will fail. Soros claims the president is a con man and a narcissist who wants the world to revolve around him. It's like the kettle calling, <laughs> or the uh, <laughs> kettle black there. <laughs> Uh, he is, uh, this has turned his narcissism into a malignant disease, a stinging condemnation, but not unexpected by the U.S. Democratic Party's most affluent donor. Still, to understand Soros's bravado, one must first appreciate his life story. George Soros was born in Georgi Swart, uh, Schwartz, was born Georgi Swartz, uh, into a prosperous upper middle class non-observant Jewish family residing in Budapest, Hungary. Experiencing the anti-Semitic prejudices arising from Nazism in 1930s Europe, the family changed its name to a Hungarian surname. At uh, Then at 13, 
the young Soros witnessed Nazi Germany occupy his country and began to and begin to strip Hungarian Jews of their rights. He recounts an in, uh, indelible life lesson delivered by his father at the time of the Nazi invasion. His father instructed the family, this is an emergency if we remain law-abiding citizens and continue our current existence, we are going to perish. The family did what it could, including having George sent from his family home to live with a government official, and they managed to survive the brutality of the Nazi rule, where half a million Hungarian Jews were sent to death camps. Yes, and um, Soros' role in sending those people to the death camps was uh, not a good one. He was ratting out many of his uh, fellow Jews and having them sent to these concentration camps by ratting them out, um, and he feels no guilt about it. None at all. Uh, that, that was what he had said uh, when he was being interviewed about that exact thing back in the 90s. Uh, Soros attended the London School of Economics where he earned a master's degree in philosophy. He ventured to the U.S. to begin a business career in various merchant banks. In 1973, at the age of 43, Soros established his own hedge fund, Quantum Fund, which has generated more than $40 billion dollars through four decades of operation, the fund made $5.5 billion in 2013 alone. Soros's meteoric hedge fund career included some notorious dealings in 1992. Soros named, was named the man who broke the Bank of England because of his short sale of 10 billion US, uh, 10 billion US dollars worth of pounds sterling, which made him a tidy $1 billion profit in the UK's infamous Black Wednesday. Similarly, in 1966, he profited from a Finnish financial crisis, and in 1977, he profited from the Asian financial crisis. Repeatedly, Soros made cash from market chaos. In fact, Soros' impact on the markets prompted Nobel Prize-winning American economist Paul Krugman in 1999 to observe, nobody who has read a business magazine in the last few years can be unaware that these days were really... uh, These days are... There really are investors who not only move money in anticipation of a currency crisis, but actually do their best to trigger that crisis for fun and profit. These new actors on the scene do not yet have a standard name. Um, My proposed name is Soroy, um, which is Soros, of course. And, um, yeah, he's uh, he's admittedly had, had... dealings with with these exact situations going on there and and caused them to worsen for his own benefit that that's how how scrupulous and um how little morals he has or unscrupulous i should say and how little morals he has soros and many others has attributed his his success in the stock markets to the theory of reflexivity reflexivity developed by soros himself in simple terms this theory is used to decipher asset bubbles, market value of securities, and value discrepancies to short and swap stocks. See, you're shorting stocks, exactly. Um, playing dirty to, to make more money. It uh, doesn't matter who else gets in the way or who he crushes in the, in the meantime. Soros reads the boom and bust cycles of the market and anticipates investors' trading patterns. The more volatile the markets, the greater the opportunity to cash in. Through his life, Soros' money has funded groups that advanced his beliefs. In 2018, he donated more than $32 billion to the Open Society Foundation, an umbrella institute Soros himself had created in 1993 to help fund groups working for justice, demographic, governance, and human rights. On its website, the OSF states, it works to build uh, vibrant and tolerant democracies whose governments are accountable to their citizens to achieve its mission, OSF, seeks to shape pol- public policies that assure greater fairness in political, legal, and economic systems and safeguard fundamental rights. Today, OSF is funding a global web of activity in 60 countries, uh, giving an average of $600 million a year to progressive causes. One core recipient of OSF uh, funding is the Tides Foundation and the Tides Centers, uh, which is which in turn directly and indirectly fund World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the Sierra Club, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the multitudes and a multitude 
of grant making philanthropic foundations across North America. In the US, the Tides Foundation is a registered charity organization fostering special interest groups, advancing progressive policy and distributing money from anonymous donors to liberal causes and political campaigns. Political campaigns. There, there's the big one right there, um, where he, he has a lot of uh, sway in political campaigns, funds them, um, and pushes, pushes to get people in that he can control and manipulate. Um, the primary, primary beneficiary of Soros and the OSF's political agenda in the U.S. has been the Democratic Party. And that's why they are where they are right now in the States. Uh, Soros' generosity to the party is legendary. In 2004, Soros spent more than $25 million to support 527 groups to defeat George W. Bush. Um, again, he's manipulating elections. Uh, in the 2016 presidential election, he spent more than $20 million on Democrats' political action committees and doled out $8 million on a pro-Hillary Clinton super PAC. In fall 2019, Soros donated $5.1 million seed money to create his own democracy PAC. Uh, then in the first three months of 2020, Soros has pumped $28.3 million into Democratic groups for the 2020 election, including $5 million uh, to pro-Biden priorities USA PAC. The flow of money is constant and well deep. Soros is intent that U.S. Trump... Uh, President Trump does indeed fail. Again, election tampering, manipulating votes, that kind of thing. George Soros is an incredible man. He survived an incredible childhood, accomplished the incredible financial success, and is now wielding incredible influence. Canadians need to know more about Soros and the shadow he, shadows he casts across our own country. Um, I wouldn't say he's an incredible man. That That is not something I would describe him. I would describe him as manipulative, um, a puppeteer and um, a, consp a conspirer, uh, definitely a man who controls many, many things using his money um, in manners that are not exactly um, above board in terms of that. He's very sneaky um, and, like I say, conniving. So part two is the core beliefs and aspirations of George Soros. Billionaire George Soros another photo of him George Soros uh, what are George Soros's core philo uh, philosophical beliefs what are the mental constructs that motivate and drive him what is Soros's view of the world and his role within the global community to address these questions is to begin to better understand Soros and the influence he wields um, I hope in a, this part he's going to be a little bit more um, getting into sort of the backdoor deals rather than just focusing on kind of the run-of-the-mill stuff we saw in the first uh, article there. George Soros's thought process re processes revolve around the philosophy of Sir Karl Popper and his classic work, The Open Society and Its Enemy. Soros studied under Popper at the London School of Economics and is not surprising, and it is not surprising that the professor's teachings resonated with the young Soros who had survived wartime Hungary. Soros became attached to the idea, to the theory of open societies that would guarantee and protect rational exchange where alternative, alternatively closed societies coerced people to submit to political authority. So he's coercing people to get go in his direction instead of letting them be coerced the other direction. So it's hitting one evil with another evil is, is basically what he's doing. Uh, Soros's early notions of open societies evolved with his life experiences and today he conveniently smudges the pure objectives of paupers uh, desired society. Okay, there we go. Smudges is a good word. He's he's blurring the lines between it being good and it being bad. That's what he's doing. Um, in 2011 essay on the subject, Soros explains what he sees as an essential adjunct to his original teachings. He writes, if thinking uh, has a manipulative function as well as a cognitive one, then it may not be necessary to gain a better understanding of reality in order to obtain the laws one wants. There is a shortcut, spinning arguments and manipulating, there we go, manipulating, public opinion to get the desired results. That's what he's doing with the news organizations right now in Canada and the States through CTV, CBC, Global, 
uh, in Canada here, and um, plus many newspapers in Canada. Uh, and then in the States, of course, the Washington Post, um, he would control that one, the New York Times, he controls that, uh, CNN, um, MSNBN, or M MSNBS, as I like to call it, um, and, and many other organizations out there. He has full control over these people, spinning them, telling them what, what they are supposed to be presenting, and they're more than willing to do it to take his money. Uh, here we see Soros's, um, oh, today... Uh, political discourse is primarily concerned with getting elected and staying in power. Here we see Soros appreciates the utility of spinning arguments. Uh, ends will justify means. Uh, again, doesn't matter who gets in his way. Another key influencer in Soros's worldview is the mentor Maurice Strong. This Canadian oil businessman and diplomat is arguably the greatest global visionary of the modern post-World Wars era. He is recognized as the founder of the international environmental movement involved in the early 1970s in the United Nations bureaucracy. Again, Soros has deep ties to the UN. Deep ties. He controls a lot of their, uh, of their, their policies and um, funds them heavily, so they, they're more than willing to push his agenda. Um, and he's fallen in line with their Agenda 21 and Agenda 30. Um, they're all all things that, that, that he's got going on here. Um, strong self-promoted mission was to empower the UN as a, the global authority that would manage a new era of global governance through three of its international organizations, the World Wildlife Fund, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and the World Resource Institute. Strong has was bent on establishing a new world order with an overseeing group of leaders within the UN, uh, stating in order to save the planet, the group decides isn't the only hope for the planet to be that the industrialized civilizations collapse. And that is what they're working towards right now, and they're effectively doing it in the States right now, and they've done it in Canada, and it's getting worse in Canada, and uh, I say it will get worse in both countries before it gets better because of his manipulation. Uh, isn't it our responsibility to bring this about? The, this group of world leaders forms a secret society to bring about an economic collapse. Right there. Right there. Uh, Soros was drawn to Strong's vision of a new world order and his machinations for the UN. For decades, the two men collaborated and directed the UN non-governmental, just like I was just saying right there, uh, governmental organizations in advancing the goals of a one world government. See, and that is scary. That is predicted. Um, if you're religious, it's predicted in the Bible that there will be a one world government. And that is what they're pushing this towards. It's the one world government that is predicted in Revelations in the Bible. Um, if you're not religious, it still should scare you. Uh, before Maurice Strong's death in 2015, American polit political commentator Glenn Beck assessed their working partnership. Maurice Strong has oh, almost as much impact on average Americans as the air that they breathe. One world government begins and ends with Maurice Strong. George Soros is merely the financier. See right there. He has money and is using it to attain his means. Beck has downplayed the role of the financier, yet Soros has proven dominant in his own right. He has effectively guided his own Open Society Foundation grant network to champion the one world government idea and through the last 30 years George Soros has published 14 books and numerous print articles that define his principles of internationalism if you haven't read these you should check out some of these articles um, that he's written um, they very much show you just how much he's working behind the scenes to manipulate and, and coerce people into, into doing his bidding uh, he repeatedly espouses that the creation of a global open society is the only way mankind can succeed against today's formidable world challenges of climate change and nuclear proliferation. One can hear echoes of both Popper and Strong. Um, and through his environmental stuff, he's playing kind of both sides of it because he's involved in both the oil side as well as the climate change side. So he's not just focused on one of those, he's, he's playing both, both, both sides. To accomplish his, his end goal. Um, the multi-billion dollar OSF is a strong arm of Soros' global activism. 
in a 2017 essay that reveals private information leaked from Soros's papers. City Journal contributed, contributing editor Stefan Kanfer exposes the underbelly of the OSF involvement in Syria. Kanfer, and, and a lot of his um, ties in a lot of these um, um, area, the, the area right around Syria there and Iraq and Iran, all that kind of area. Uh, he's it's because of all the oil that he has there and he's using it to get money to help keep fund things so like he's he's definitely again like I say playing both sides underneath its lofty rhetoric the organization was clearly devoted to the eradication of national sovereignty uh, a key open society paper hacked in its entirety described the Syrian refugee crisis as an opportunity to shape conversations about rethinking migrations governance Translation, use um, agitprop to, I'm not 100% sure what that word actually is, um, to flood Europe and the U.S. with evacuees, uh, among them some probable terrorists, um, terrorists again or another tool, uh, make the old borders and institutions irre irrelevant and in the process create a world liberated from the restraints of constitutionalism. American exceptionalism, free market capitalism, and other obsolete items or isms. See, he's, he's manipulating the Democratic Party to destroy the U.S. That is what he wants, is to destroy the U.S. Um, so that he can control it. Um, he's effectively already done that in Canada here with Trudeau. Trudeau is more than willing to kiss his butt. Um, it's, it's Trump who's, who's a problem for him because he stands up to him. Um, another illustrative example of Soros' financing social discord can be found with the Extinction Rebellion, a UK-based global environmental movement with a publicly stated aim of using non-violent civil disobedience to prompt um, action on climate change. However, in an interne internal briefing memo of XR's members, it is evident that the organization's mission is not so well-intentioned. This is verbatim from the XR memo. And before we continue, I'll just point out um, with what I'm talking about with his uh, manipulating the, the environmentalist, he doesn't really care about the environment. He's using the environmentalism um, and, and buying off scientists to back his, his positions so that he can ultimately collapse our economies and destroy these economies around the world through his uh, environmental push. Um, and movement, and even though that really has not anything to do with what he actually wants, they're all just tools to be used so that he can take over the world and ultimately accomplish his new world order, his one world government. Um, so the quote is, to show to radical people, the internationally and internationally, that it is possible to have an impossible plan and carry out a rebellion, however small or large, thus increase the Overton window. Um, of acceptable discourse and the ecological crisis to create a national conversation about the eco ecological crisis and the climate breakdown, including that our families, communities, society, and state are facing existential threat. This includes to discuss our demands with the government and political parties also to support further uprisings to demand change off the back of the door we open to build structure community and test prototypes in preparation for the coming structural collapse of the regimes of western democracies see he doesn't care about democracy he not at all does he care about that uh, now seen as inevitable due to stored up crisis this prepar thus preparing a funda uh, foundation to transform society and resist fascism slash other extremes. Hence him being known as the head of Antifa, even though I haven't seen proof that he is, but, you know, uh, there's just so many people who, who suspect that he really is, and, and this exact quote is, is part of what, what, why people believe that he is p um, partly a leader in, in uh, Antifa, whether or not he is or not. That I can't say one way or another. Uh, this includes creating Rising the Wreckage, a citizen's assembly based on sortation. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, this is why a lot of people suspect civil war is, is heading for, for the states. 
um, right now and all the tensions building up is because he's funding these groups that are that are causing the riots and the and the protests and um, the defunding of the police you know he's behind a lot of that to just accomplish his means of destroying democracies the US us Britain Australia like he's very successful at these countries especially that I just mentioned um, supported in part by OSF funds XR last year had more than one million pounds in its war chest. The Capital Research Center is an American organization examining how foundations, charities, and other nonprofits spend money and get involved in politics and advocacy. Shane Devine recently wrote for the center an expose on George Soros, in which he comments Soros is honest about who he is, repeatedly calling himself a selfish man who sought money and recognition throughout his life to satisfy his large ego. But he argues that this selfishness was ultimately good since he was able to cultivate it into a moral force through philo uh, philanthropy. So it's, it's moral because it's what he wants. It doesn't matter who gets hurt in the meantime, it's what he wants. Um, and so, yeah, it's not really philo philanthropy when it's for your own end. Um, in 2018, New York Times interview, Soros himself explains his ideological approach to the world matters. My ideology is non-ideological. I'm the man, uh, in, I'm in the club of non-clubs, but surely George Soros, Jess. His intentional influences tell us otherwise. The modus operandi of the hundreds of groups around the world financed by the OSF tell us otherwise. George Soros is a man with the design for this world and every country including canada factors into his plan for one world government so part three is his canadians chess game and you can see him meeting george soros meeting with trudeau and with uh trudeau's second in command freeland right there um, freeland is known to have big connections to soros she yeah she was interviewing him for a long time and wrote a lot of stuff for him so yeah, they have huge ties together. The United Nations representative of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea made news headlines in late, uh, late uh, last August when he critically assessed the actions of George Soros and his Open Society Institute. Anatolio Dongma, I, I, I probably slaughtering those names, was furious at a Soros-sponsored Amnesty International report in, to the UN. It's known that George Soros is a billionaire, financial speculator, and a criminal with obvious geostrategic and imperialistic interests who has been dedicating his life to support imperialist movements. Uh, Ma cited a list of Soros's destructive interventions in a different in different countries as being endless, and he concluded his rant stating, "The children of this nation cannot be moved as pieces on the global chessboard where the criminal George Soros is playing." Ma is not the first, nor will he be the last, to liken Soros to a chess player moving pieces across the global across the globe in some end game pursuit it's an apropos analogy soros was has repeatedly claimed he is playing towards a globalist vision of one world government spending billions through the years soros has acquired many pieces and placed them in positions around the world indeed canada has a store of soros chess pieces in the nation's capital let's examine the chessboard Central to advancing Sor the Soros agenda in our country is the $1.3 million U.S. knight errand, Gerald Butts. Yes, Gerald Butts is a coward um, and, and a puppet. Uh, Canadians have come to know Butts as the most powerful man in Ottawa, the BFF of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Yes, because all of Trudeau's friends are successful all the time. Um, however, before he reunited with his university pal to embark on an election campaign that would end with the capturing of the Prime Minister's office, Butts was the head of the World Wildlife Foundation, um, World Wildlife Fund in Canada. 
Public records show that from 2008 to 2012, Butts was the chairman of the World Wildlife Fund Canada, one of the most international agencies born from Maurice Strong's UN construct and financially supported through the years by Soros' coffers, where he proved an effective and unapologetic globalist mouthpiece furthering Soros' agenda on international stages and in closed-door meetings with the world of the World Economic Forum and Bilderberg Group. Then in late 2012, Butts received a most generous $361,642 severance for a package from World Wildlife Fund to support him through a volunteer position on Trudeau's campaign team. Uh, full credit is deserving to Canada Canadian investigative journalist Vivian Krauss, who has doggedly followed the money to uncover the behind the scenes activities of a host of globalists bent on impacting resource development and political interest in Canada. As it happened, the knight errant was also a Trojan horse that opened the gates to, of Ottawa to many of Soros's minions. The Financial Post reports Butts was used. Uh, was he, would use his new powerful position to bring other former campaigners with him. Marlo Reynolds, Chief of Staff to Environmental Environment Minister Catherine McKenna, uh, is past Executive Director of the Tides-backed um, Pembina Institute. Zoe Caron, Chief of Staff to Natural Resource Minister Amarjeet Sohi, is also a former WWF Canada official. Sarah Goodman of the on the Prime Minister's sta staff is a former Vice President of Tides Foundation of Tides Canada. In a recent Hill Times column, we learn Goodman has just been promoted to Director of Policy in the PMO, but also brought a, a pack of colleagues with him from his stay in Ontario Premier Dalton McKinty's office. Katie Telford, now the PM's Chief of Staff, uh, Zita Astravas, Matthew Mendelssohn, John Zerukelli, um, that's probably Chelly actually, uh, Ben Chin, Brian Clow, John Broadhead, Mary Nick, um, now a Cabinet Minister responsible for Liberal Policies in Toronto, to name a few. But his maneuvering has solidified a globalist brain trust at the epicenter of the Trudeau government. Another of Soros's pieces adorning a key square on the Ottawa chessboard is Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Everything, Krista Freeland. There is a personal friendship between George Soros and Freeland that goes back over a decade when she was a journalist, as what I saw about covering uh, European politics and chasing after the uber-rich. In 2011 article entitled Rise of the New Global Elite, Freeland describes Soros as a good uh, technocrat, friendly plutocrat. In another article in 2012, she gushes over him. Soros is a more narrowly focused hedgehog. Uh, he... He has been pondering, articulating, elaborating, and publicizing variations on one big idea for more than half a century. George Soros enjoyed Freeland's adorations and their friendship flourished, so much so that when Freeland was employed in the mid-2010s, he asked his friend to write his biography. Soros commissioned Freeland to be his scribe before she moved back to Canada to run for Parliament in 2015 with his backing. Since the 2015 election, there has been an interesting interplay between chess master Soros and his queen. He was very pleased to see her electoral success and commented that with her, he has very great hopes for Canada. In the initial Trudeau cabinet, Freeland has given, uh, was given the Minister of Foreign Affairs position to help chart a new course for Canadian diplomacy, and he keeps adding new titles onto what she's what she's doing, giving her more power, um, and ultimately giving Soros more power. In that role, Freeland carried forward a globalist viewpoint that, not surprisingly, aligns with Soros's worldview. Every few months, photos would surface of the two of them, some formal, some informal. Canadians will recall that shot of Soros giving an audience to the PM 
and her when Justin Trudeau first appeared at the UN Assembly to announce Canada's back. More recently, Canadian News showcased Freeland in her position as Deputy PM conversing with Soros about his thoughts on the New World Order and working with China to accomplish that. Nobody can question the depth of their friendship and the comfortableness displayed in this exchange. The year 2015 was pivotal, was pivotal for George Soros' fortunes in Canada. It was the year that he crowned a king. There is no need to blabber the significance of this coup. Justin Trudeau has been true to George Soros' script. In, many, in May of this year, at the Coronavirus Global Response Conference, he called for more globalism and that Canada is poised to take care of the world. With all of our funding that we don't have, it's why he's spending so many billions of dollars that we don't have and is racking up way more debt than we can ever repay. Um, and this, this is exactly why. It's his agenda right here. Um, I think it's extremely important that uh, the way the world has come together, understanding that a global crisis requires a global response. And rather than taking care of our own, he's taking care of global interests. The PM applauded the efforts of the World Health Organization and the UN, both backed by Soros, and one can imagine Maurice Strong himself would have given a standing ovation for this performance. There are other noteworthy Canadian pieces in Soros's game. In nurturing the faith of global finances and environmentalism, there is the Bishop Mark uh, Carney, who recently moved diagonally back to Canadian soil. Carney has just has joined forces with Soros in their fight to back to turn back the populism of Brexit. And then the then Governor of Bank of England emerged during the Brexit process as the unofficial leader of the campaign Project Fear, a movement uh, that Soros invested five hundred thousand pounds in. Now Carney has accepted a UN appointment uh, as a special envoy for the climate action and finance, a volunteer position while he waits for his next opportunity. In the Rooks position, a corner piece for Ottawa's backroom liberals is an organization called Canada 2020. McLean's magazine called them the progressive think tank that really runs Canada. This column does not allow enough space to reveal Canada's 2020 ties to the Obama Democrats and the pools of Soros' open society foundation money that Trudeau's political operatives have had access to over the years. Um, yes, yeah, so exactly. He, his ties to all these different places. He, he does actually connect all these different different sources where he takes control of all this. There is C.P. Catherine McKenna, named Minister of Environmental and Climate Change in 2015, who was, who was swept into Parliament by a third-party campaign that turned the Ottawa Centre riding red. There is the current Minister of Canadian Heritage, Stephen Guibault, whose Montreal environmental organization was, um, was given well over $100,000 from the Tide Foundation. Then there are countless pawns dutifully marching forward in well-heeled environmental and political groups to, sh um, to shout down and trample local interests for some greater cause. Too many pieces, too many moves, and too fully, uh, to, to fully comprehend what is happening. It's the game, according to the chess aficionado, George Soros. Yeah, so I mean, he's proven to, to back the protests and blockades for the pipelines and blockades of the um, CN Rail or CP Rail. Uh, he, he's blocked all that kind of stuff and he's, he, he funds a lot of these protests that go on in cities that, that we're seeing across Canada and the US. Uh, so part four, George Soros casts a long shadow across Canada. So here we're just really, I'm more tackling Canadian side of things, but um, all the stuff that he is doing in Canada, he's also working in many other countries like the US, Australia, Britain, China, like many, many different nations. Um, you could be a roughneck 100 kilometers outside of Fort McMurray, a Wet Sioux uh, nation member 
employed. Again, their group was hired by George Soros to protest, and a lot of the other Wetzian did not actually support these protests that were going on. Um, a lot of their leaders just didn't actually support it, but George Soros had paid off enough of them that they were protesting under that name. Um, uh, employed by Coastal Gaslink or even a backbench liberal MP representing your maritime constituents, and in all cases, the forces that are driving Canadian policy decisions and impacting your life are obscured to you. What is unknown to many is the influence of billionaire George Soros. For a man who casts such a long shadow across our country, most Canadians are stumbling forward without any true sense of what the Soros world vision means for the future of Canada. It's going to be devastating, more devastating than what we've seen already. George Soros' uh, philanthropic ag agency, the Open Society Foundations, funds hundreds of millions of dollars annually to advance a globalist agenda and the specter of one world government governed by the, UN Na uh, by the United Nations. That is their goal. They want to rule everything. For the past 20 years, Canada has been pulled into the Soros vortex with the infiltration of the OSF-funded lobby organizations and with his own recalibration of the Liberal Party of Canada. And I would wager the NDP is probably in his back pocket as well. Um, since the election of the Liberals in 2015, the country has become an unfolding post-national uh, experiment. Ostensibly, Soros took control of Canadian policy with the electoral victory of the Liberals. It is well documented in their research of the Canada Decides report to Elections Canada, as well as investigative journalist Vivian Krauss, that the 2015 election campaign is a textbook example of foreign influence on election results, which is illegal and the Liberals should be held accountable for it, but they will not. It is one scandal that the news just absolutely will not talk about. For Soros, def uh, defeating Stephen Harper was held out as an important pivot. Soros facilitated exchanges between the U.S. Democratic backroom operatives and the Liberal Party campaign team, and he channeled OSF funds into Tides Canada, an offshoot to Soros's left-of-center American Tides Foundation. That connection is why the Democrats and the Liberals use the exact same um, slogan, which is Build Back Better. The exact same slogan. Um, one of my viewers actually pointed out to me in one of my other videos, and I thank him for this, that it is actually a UN slogan. And when you trace back the origins of the UN slogan, it actually goes right back to George Soros' foundations. So that is the major tie, blatantly obvious in front of you, the Democrats and the Liberals using the exact same wording. Um, with Tides Canada financial support, Organizations um, led, led now and Dogwood spent millions of dollars and mobilized thousands of campaign workers to defeat Harper's conservatives in a total of 40 ridings. And Sconston Auto, with the majority four year mandate, the Trudeau government began to systematically transform the country's economic and societal fortunes into a Sorrel's phantasm. Um, which we see it has destroyed us. COVID has just further enabled them to keep going with this, um, which is why a lot of people suspect it was purposely released. I am not saying that, though, because I don't, I don't have any proof of that, so um, I would need to see proof to really, truly believe it. Um, central to the Liberal government's agenda has been an unwavering commitment to global environmentalism and the, react and the reduction of carbon emissions, in its first budget, the government introduced a punitive carbon tax scheduled and a schedule to increase it, yeah, which they're planning to go forward with increasing it and adding a second tax to attempt to meet a Paris Accord target by which Canadians will reduce global carbon emissions by less than half of 1%. Fast forward to today and Canadians are about to learn the second part of the Liberals' environmental agenda, subsidizing green industry projects. Uh, no matter how much it breaks us. G uh, Gerald Butts was the architect of the Ontario Green Energy Program 
and now he is masterminding a national building back better. There we go. <laughs> that was what I was talking about. Campaign to introduce government-sponsored green programs worth billions of taxpayer dollars. But his green initiative is reportedly to deliver a post-coronavirus Canadian economy away from the rich fossil fuel resources. An anti-lobby anti-oil lobby has always been the core mission of the OFS funded environmental causes from the American lobbyists first meetings in 2008 when they de they devised the tar sands campaign an environmental lobby has been relentless in smearing the reputation of Canadian oil and gas industries which most of their smears are false because these oil industries actually leave the land far nicer than when they first moved into them they replant all the the um, ground uh, trees the ground everything that they're replanting it all to make it better than when they left or when they arrived and so yeah it, it's just it's very manipulative and conniving what they're doing to spread all these lies um in a number of her articles Krauss surmises that 10 years and a half billion dollar misinformation campaign there we go on the alberta oil sector has effectively turned many canadians against the development of our country's energy resources these are sheep people who are who don't uh, think for themselves they just take whatever the whatever they're told and they and they go with it rather than actually doing their own research and looking into things um, everybody needs to do their own research and, and not just take somebody's word for it not even my word for it just go and do your research um, playing off this public opinion campaign the trudeau government kneecapped the canadian oil and gas industry by introducing debilitating legislations which has cost tens of thousands of jobs across Canada. Um, bill C-69 banning future pipelines and Bill C-48 banning Canadian oil bearing tankers on the west coast. Together, foreign lobbyists in the Trudeau government have landlocked western Canadian oil and gas and prevented it from reaching international markets. Given that Canadian oil and gas exports accounted for more than 112 billion or 19 percent of canadians total export revenue last year this policy direction is nothing less than sabotaging the country's economy at a time when we need our economy as an aside canada's finance financial standing has been directly impacted by the trudeau government's unbridled spending and its year after over year deficit financing since 2015, this government added approximately $80 billion of Canada's debt load, and that is, that is, yeah, it's it, it's it's increasing at a rapid rate. Um, and now, with the splurge of coronavirus spending, Canadians have taken on another $343 billion of debt this year so far, and that was back in July, and it's of course skyrocketed more since then. Um, this mountain of new debt will require financing by international bankers and billionaires like George Soros, who are sure to capitalize on our indebted nation. Nowhere is Soros' direct influence on Canadian policies more evident than in the Trudeau government's promotion of UN priorities, particularly the concept of open borders. Early in the Liberals' mandate, they announced Canada had entered into a partnership with the UN and George Soros to implement refugee sponsorship programs around the world, which is again the one world government. They're moving, shuffling pawns all across the board. Refugees are pawns to them. The Trudeau government had introduced a new private refugee sponsorship program in 2016 and Soros looked for the program to be introduced into other countries. The UN program had uh, would expand private sponsorship criteria encourage greater resettlement efforts for migrants, and advocate for refugee protection measures. Um, the point person for Canada on this global initiative is General but uh, Gerald Butts. And um, they're using these refugees because they know that they will vote the way that they want them to because they're indebted to them. So if they have their way, we'll never see another party rule again. Uh, which is what has fueled the uh, separation and alienation movements throughout Canada here. Since 2015, Canada has consistently been a champion of UN initiatives. Recall the celebrated tweet by PM Trudeau that Canada would become refugee, would welcome refugees crossing the United States border 
stating that our country has open borders for all who wish to live here. Further to this, the Liberals have, in produ have produced new immigration thresholds to align that um, uh, thresholds that align with UN promoted targets and promise to bring in more than a million new Canadians in less than three years. They have also pushed forward the approval of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that was presented as legally non-binding for our country, yet today is being employed in Canadian courts. This Liberal government has been a cheerleader of the UN's climate change agenda and recently a staunch defender of the World Health Organization's response to coronavirus pandemic. Remarkably, in five short years, the Trudeau government has changed the character of the country and their efforts have been ferried along with the affluence of George Soros at the forefront of Canada's march across, uh, march towards a post-national state to Soros's disciples. But Trudeau, Freeland, Carney, McKenna, Guibault, etc. Ca Canadians are now coming to recognize our worrisome situation. Bankrupt finances um, with limiting, resor uh, limiting means to generate new wealth and laws and regulations that are increasingly adherent to UN agencies, that, uh, their mandates and policies. On August 12th, Canadians have the opportunity to reflect on the man who is largely responsible for our new status in the world. George Soros turns 90 that day, and his accomplishments around the world will undoubtedly be uh, feeded.